guess we should start now. Uh, all right. Now, good evening. Good afternoon for those who are on the West Coast and good morning for those in Asia. Welcome to CPEX Innovation 2022. My name is Andy Shi, and I'm the Executive Director of CPAC. I want to start by acknowledging the land I'm on. I am situated in the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haidonosi, and the Wendat peoples. This city is also known by its anglicized Monhawk name, Toronto. Now to kick things off, I'd like to call upon the chair of our program committee, Ms. Beth Song, to make some opening remarks. Beth. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon uh, for our friends in the West Coast and good morning for our friends in China. Uh, on behalf of the committee, the CPAC board and our president, I'd like to welcome and thank everyone for attending this annual InnoVision Summit tonight. Uh, this year, we are delighted to bring to you an exciting topic. Uh, we'll explore the infinite possibilities with Metaverse. If you type the word Metaverse, your device may suggest it's a typo. That would tell you how new the concept is. The latest trends in technology and its impact to our work and daily life are what CPAC Innovation Summit wants to present every year. Tonight, we'll hear from four experts in this field from Canada, China, and the States. Thank you, speakers, for your time and passion, sharing your knowledge and expertise about metaverse. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to also quickly talk a little bit more about CPAC. This year is CPAC's 30th anniversary. In these three decades, CPAC has been serving the community of internationally educated professionals to help with their integration and career success in Canadian society. Last year, CPAC Institute was officially launched. Its mission is to provide research-based support for the understanding and elimination of systematic barriers to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and for addressing specific issues concerning the well-being of Chinese Canadians. If you are one of our 30,000 members, thank you for the constant support and engagement with CPAC. If you're not a member yet, please join us, be a part of our family. We'd like to hear your voice, get your help to advocate with us on issues important to immigrants and our communities. From social justice and human rights to access to services and opportunities. Last but not least, I'd like to thank the committee members, our staff and everyone behind the scene who made this event happen. Hope you all have a fruitful and fun evening. Thank you. Back to Andy. Thank you, Bess. Now, without further ado, let's open the curtain and enter the metaverse. Tonight, we have experts from Canada, China, and the US to discuss various aspects of the metaverse. At the end of the presentations, there will also be time for questions and answers. I want to thank our speakers sincerely for taking the time from their very busy schedules to prepare and come here to share their knowledge and expertise with us as a public service. The first speaker on our program tonight is Dr. Qin, Dr. Dong Changqin. He's in Beijing, China, where it is now Saturday morning. We thank him very sincerely for getting up on the weekend to do this for us. Dr. Qin is a professor of intelligence system at the Beihang University and the chief scientist and partner of Kodemar Inc. Previously, he was the chief scientist and dean of the AI Institute at Keep Inc. Dr. Qin specializes in artificial intelligence and the author of over 120 academic papers in an academic book. He will start our discussion tonight 
with a historical overview of the technologies that lead to today's metaverse. Dr. Qin. Okay, uh, thanks Andy. Let me sharing the, my, uh, my screen. Okay, uh, can you see the screen? Uh, not yet. All right. Yeah, we see. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's start it. Uh, thanks, CPAC, for inviting me. So, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Zeng Chang, and uh, actually, I have been working in the artificial intelligence area for about 20 years. So, today, we're... But from my perspective, I will um, talk about more about how artificial intelligence uh, will play uh, in the uh, in, in the metaverse. So uh, let's start from a very uh, fundamental question: that you know, metaverse is a kind of a plus to our life, or it will be a kind of indispensable to our future life. So I will divide it in my talk into four parts. The first. I will talk about the physical world with imagination. So the metaverse from our point of view is the place, is a virtual world full of our uh, human imagination uh, creation. And the second, I will talk about the machine intelligence and the world of the algorithms, basically is something about artificial intelligence. And the third part is about the space without gravity. Uh, this is the metaverse and what kind of uh, possible applications uh, we will have in the uh, in the, the the future of the metaverse, and the last part we'll talk about the meet the future. But my focus will be on how artificial intelligence uh, will be uh, in the uh, metaverse. Okay. Um, first, uh, everybody knows that our human being are dominating this pen this planet. And we're not the strongest, we're not the fattest. And, uh, you know, and uh, considering about the surviving skills, we're not even comparable to the mouth. But why we were dominating uh, this world simply just because we are smart? Yeah, but we're kind of individually smart, but it's not enough. You know, some animals, for example, chimpanzee, they can be uh, also individually smart. They can use the tools for getting some food. Um, but considering the, collect, uh, con considering the collectively smartness, ant colony, they can do a lot of things. So even one ant is nearly zero intelligence, but by collaboration, they can do quite a lot of things, which are quite amazing. So considering this is the uh, new evolutionary theory. So according to the Martin Nowak, who is the Harvard professor, and who also published over three, more than 300 papers and 40 natures and 30 sciences. So very influential uh, new evolutionist. And he considered we may add natural cooperation at the third fundamental principle of the evolution beside the mutation and natural selection. Um, because, you know, it, especially in the human society, we have a different kind of the uh, collaboration that reshaped our language and the culture. So the collaboration is very important in uh, very important for the humankind. And so we're not only individually smart, we are collectively smart. We can do quite a lot of things if moving from me to we. We can play a great game. You know, we can uh, by collaboration, we can set up manufacturing and as a human society that need a very large scale kind of a, a large scale collaboration. And we also know the animals, they can uh, collaborate in a small packs such as wolves and the chimpanzees, but comparing to humankind, it's not the same scale. You know, you never see the ants, they can initiate a revolution, right? And they can hunt their queen or kings, but it happens in the human society. So the human society, they have a kind of a storytelling skill. So everybody can believe some stories. That stories could be about a country, uh, could be uh, about a company, uh, could be a religion and all these things. So such a kind of story, uh, such a kind of a belief in storytelling 
um, can make humankind can largely uh, collaborate each other. So we can also, you know, collaborate with the strangers. So that's only human. Uh, we can collaborate in such a scale. So there must be some secrets behind it. So according to the, uh, uh, you know, the writer of the uh, famous the Sapiens, uh, the birth of the humankind, according to Yuval Harari, and uh, such a kind of a large scale collaboration of, of the humankind, just because of the two secrets. One is about communication. The second is storytelling. So communication becomes the power of the humankind. So we, in, in such a way, we can uh, collaborate in a very large scale. And, uh, you know, the possible, uh, you know, collaboration is possible only through the uh, effective communication. So back to the ancient times, our ancestors can see, uh, you know, an animal, a beast through a different kind of ways of communication, but not only language, right? And also, uh, they, we, we can uh, communicate through the ages. So our ancestor can leave some marks and Asian language on the cave of the, on the walls of the cave. So today we can still read it about what happening about a thousand years ago. So the communication and the storytelling, this make a human of ourselves. So that's why we are so uh, dominating this earth and why we're so powerful. So not only because we are individually smart, but we are also uh, collectively smart. And so communication from the uh, bio bio uh, the communication, if you're considering uh, it's a biological basis, uh, you can think some example like this. For example, you have something wanted to tell, maybe an object or maybe something you wanna tell. So you have a, a kind of um, shape or you have a kind of uh, uh, a concept in your conceptual space, in your brain. And uh, in order to express your concept to other people, uh, as a speaker, so you have to translate your concept and your brain into some uh, uh, words. And these words will be uh, received by listeners and they can recreate these words uh, to recreate some conceptual uh, definition in your brain. So if you consider uh, we were thinking about something, you, your brain just like a flashlight. You are, you know, they're flashing at a different parts. So when the listener can listen to what you're talking about and their brain also, you know, they flash a different part of the brain. So uh, finally, um, your brain and his brain can be kind of synchronized. That's the uh, uh, listener can understand what you're talking about. Yeah, so that's how we, uh, from biological view, that's how we're doing the, how, how we do the communication. And uh, another important thing is about the memory. So the humankind have a very special uh, skills about the memory. So we can uh, recording what we have seen in the daytime. So before you go to bed, you can think about what happened for the whole day. And uh, you basically just like playing a movie and you can see what's really happening uh, you know, today. But also you have another uh, different skills. It's like you can modify your memory somehow. So you can modify your unhappy memories into happy ones. So this is a kind of very uh, special cognitive ability that we, uh, hardly, we can hardly see from other animals. So, uh, you know, what really happens in the physical world uh, that follows some very physical rules. But if you modify your memory, you can actually uh, create something that never happened in this real world. And this sometimes we call is imagination. And, uh, you know, some neuro, uh, neuro, some neuroscientists also argue that memory and imagination, just the two sides of the same coin. And, but uh, imagination, they actually uh, like the human to go beyond our, you know, this physical world. So for example, uh, some uh, famous businessman or scientists, uh, they have very vast imagination, especially the artists. So for example, the Steve Jobs, you know, they haven't seen all these mobile phones in this world, but you know, he thinks maybe, you know, we can uh, build a phone uh, which are different from the current phones, but that phone never existed. 
you know, they actually invented the iPhone from his brain, from his imagination, from his modification for, of their memories. And then, you know, this is the uh, source of the uh, innovation and the creation. Okay, and uh, so what I'm trying to say in the first part is that the, the, the collaboration of the human being make our humans so dominating in this world, make our the masters of this earth. And also the, um, the, uh, the imagination and is the source of the, re the creation. And in the physical world, the communication is kind of limited. So we only know maybe, you know, not more than 100 or 200 people in our lifetime. So the communication is one-to-one, -one. but with the help of a technology, especially the information technology, it is possible that we can communicate it to more than maybe a thousand, maybe 10,000 or 100,000 peoples. So this is make our communication more effective and also can make you know the the human population they can work collectively to finish something that never happened before, and also that will um, you know giving the power uh, give us the power about the uh, uh, you know the new uh, the new kind of innovation and the, the something uh, about the new uh, creation. Okay, and the second part is is my area is about the machine intelligence and the world of algorithms. So let's start to have a quick review about this technology and I will see how this artificial intelligence technology will, what kind of role it will play in the metaverse. And let's start from the uh, definites. So uh, everybody knows that the computer is based on the zero and the ones. And as a sinophile, Leibniz used to, uh, you know, learn something about the I Ching in China, that's the uh, this hexagrams. It's called Bagua, it's very popular in ancient Chinese culture. Uh, this is also kind of the uh, binary coding. So if you see that, you can uh, see this uh, small scratch, the two small scratch is zero, is one long scratch is one. So you can see all these symbols can be represented by zero and ones. So for, for the one above, it's just the zero, 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 and the one down there is the one, one, one. So, uh, this is the new way of recording the numbers, right? Using binary numbers is very effective. We don't need many, we don't need many numbers, just two, one and a zero is enough for all these numbers. And uh, go to, uh, when we come to the, uh, to the Boolean algebra and uh, we can using the zero to represent the false and one represent the true. So the uh, false and the true, they can uh, do the logical calculation, for example, and, or, or negation. And if we're using one and zero uh, to uh, represent this logical calculations, so the bully consider uh, some new way uh, using the abstract algebra, or we call the mathematical logic to, uh, how can we use the logical reasoning or logical operations to realize the uh, numerical calculation? So for example, we, uh, can calculate the three plus two is five, but in binary numbers, three is a series of the zero and ones, two is also a, a sequence of zero and ones. So we just put into, th we just put uh, three and two as the inputs and the outputs will be five and also a sequence of zero and ones. So basically we are trying to uh, design, is it possible we can uh, using some logical reasoning like only uh, or and and the negation and um, we design a particular mechanism. So this is sequences from input to output. They finished, uh, they, uh, they just realized the addition. So if we can, uh, using the logical reasoning to realize the uh, addition, we can do subtraction and multiplication as well. And uh, physically and uh, sharply embodying the invented transistor and the transistor is kind of like an automatic switch. And this circuit will built to do this logical reasoning. So, you know, uh, when the transistor is ready, we can use different, uh, many transistors to uh, formulate a logical circuit that can finish a different kind of a calculation. That is how electronic computer started. Uh, but theoretically, uh, we need Alan Turing. So Alan Turing uh, kind of uh, built a theoretical model how a computer will work. Basically, the idea uh, he was considering is how uh, to decide if a kind of a problem is computable. And they actually building a kind of a conceptual model 
of the uh, uh, of our the first the, the very first the computer is the Turing machine, and he also invented a kind of a state machine. You can see the the, the circles on the right. It was state machine is kind of like uh, today's the neural networks. So this state machine can update their states and uh, dynamically, um, but I also uh, consider the intelligence from the bottom up way. Uh, this is today we call the deep learning on the neural networks. But you know the very early um, neural networks also you, we, we can uh, no, we can retrospect to the Turing, and of course Turing uh, has the tragedy life and he died at the forty two and uh, by um, committed suicide eating an apple. Uh, with uh, eating a poison snake apple. So uh, even uh, many years later, someone even asked Steve Jobs, so you start Apple, uh, design logo, you know, the logo has been bit a bit, has been bitten a bit, is that you were trying to memorize Turing. So Steve uh, answered that uh, that was a kind of a coincidence, but it was, I, I wish that was true. And, uh, you know, this is a kind of a coincidence in the uh, computer world. And Turing, also the father of the artificial intelligence, he published a paper in mind. It's called the Computing and Machinery and Intelligence. Uh, in that paper, he mentioned about a Turing test. And if you want to know more about it, you can actually watch this movie, The Imitation Game. And they give you a lot of the history and some basic ideas about the very early uh, stage of the computer science. And uh, so in summary, uh, basically we're trying to build a mechanical mind mechanical mind trying to make our mind, our thinking like a, a into some mechanical process, just like we're building a cars. So we understand that all these cars are kind of run by, 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 di by different gears, right? And uh, sometimes we found that the car, even the airplanes are pretty so hard, but from these engineers in their eyes, you know, just like a gearing. So these gears, you know, uh, initiate to drive another gear or something like that. And in computer science, we may, we may think that artificial intelligence is kind of uh, very hard to understand, but um, from our point of view, so each code, it is like a gear. So they are kind of, um, you know, driving each other to um, make our thinking or the information processing very, very clear. So there's not much uncertainty <laughs> in artificial intelligence, though many people think that AI is kind of a mythical, but actually it is kind of a, it's a very deterministic, yeah, as, as far as you can understand very deep about each piece of the code. And the birth of AI, so when this kind of a technology was already, uh, a, a few scientists, they gathered uh, for a symposium, they finally actually coined the term of artificial intelligence. And the one who invented the term is that they draw McCarthy. So there were famous scientists like uh, Marvin Minsky and uh, Shannon and Herbert Simon that went to the symposium. And after this, the, the, the symposium, they go, they go back to their universities like, like MIT, Stanford, and the Carnegie Mellon University. So all these universities become, you know, <clears throat> the big names in artificial intelligence as well as the computer science. Uh, okay, and uh, interestingly, the name of artificial intelligence is uh, coined by John McCarthy, and uh, he is the uh, what we call the uh, symbolicism. Uh, he's in the symbolicism, the way of using the uh, logical reasoning to uh, realize the human intelligence because he believed that human intelligence, one of the main characters uh, of the human intelligence is we can use in logic to induce, to deduce something we haven't known. And they actually invented a new kind of a programming language to do these the symbolic reasoning. But uh, actually, but today's artificial intelligence and especially the deep learning, uh, we are using not a different, we were using a different approach. We actually call the uh, connectionism. So we're trying to build the, um, the information processing uh, system from, uh, from bottom to the up. And uh, we, are, we, we can, for example, to using a mathematical model to simulate uh, how a neuron firing and uh, finally, uh, this becomes uh, the, the, the area of, of the neural network and the finally uh, becomes the area of the deep learning. And uh, learning and induction is the uh, basically the, 
the, the, the tools we're using in the uh, current artificial intelligence. So for example, if you wanna distinguish uh, a dog and a cat, and we can run a program to do so. So uh, basically all these images uh, of the dog and the cats can be transformed into a matrix of the numbers. And then we need to find uh, appropriate function uh, using that function, we can translate all these uh, matrices into uh, like, a, uh, like a judgment of the uh, false and the true. And if it's a false, we can say it's a cat. If it's true, we say it's a dog. So there's nothing mythical there. This is the just mathematical calculation. So this is basically how computer are doing anything. Yeah, so we every time we see something, you know, very hard to understand for, for human mind, and you know the human intelligence. Uh, for example, we have a semantics in language. All these, uh, all these things. If we trying to using the computer to simulate or imitate the human behavior, so we need to design some mathematical model using the numerical calculation to imitate how we process this information in our brain. So uh, this is also basically uh, what is the current um, artificial intelligence uh, technology is about. Um, this is about image classification. So we translate every image into a high dimensional data. Uh, basically, um, this is a very high dimensions. For example, it could be a thousand, it could be a million dimensions and then each image will be like a dot, will be like a point in this, in this high dimensional space. And then we need to find a high dimensional uh, function uh, trying to separate all these groups. That's how we do the uh, classification of the cats and dogs in the real mathematics. And this is what we call the semantic gap because when we see in the images, you know, for example, this is a beautiful butterfly, you know, we thought that's beautiful, but beautiful is, is a very hard concept to be defined in, uh, quantitatively. And all this image, can be shown like uh, just number, right? And how we actually given, uh, we are given this image or this uh, big matrix of numbers. How can we see a beautiful from all these numbers? That's why we need a function. So that function all sometimes we call the mathematical model or, ma or machine learning model. So we can map these numbers into the uh, category which has been uh, labeled by human uh, you know, this is a beautiful, this is ugly, you know, this is happy, this is unhappy. So we are using the human knowledge to label these categories and then give you an image. So we will see using this function and the which category it will be mapped into. So that's basically how the uh, current machine learning is doing. And uh, of course, you know, uh, the deep learning, uh, when, when the deep learning is invented, they have a kind of a revolution in the artificial intelligence. Uh, research area here, but also into the um, the whole society, uh, and uh, you know the demon for vision. Basically, um, you know we may see something outside, and uh, we're not like a video camera. We're not like a camera trying to record everything, and we will see something red. It's like a demon. In your brain will shout. We will see something green. Another demon shot. We will see a triangle, and a third demon shot. So we may see an object basically some demon of your brain, they shot, they firing your, your neurons. That's how it, it, we actually um, trying to recognize different kinds of objects. And uh, even, uh, even, you know, for finding the uh, cognitive, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, to discover it, uh, to discover the, uh, the, the discovery of the cognitive uh, uh, mechanisms in the, the vision system, make, you know, Sperry Hubble and the Wiesel, they won the Nobel Prize in 1981. And the similar ideas have been uh, used in the current uh, deep learning research. For example, given the face like this, and you can using a small kernel, we can, you can see on the left is uh, it's like eye, and they can just, you know, uh, trying to uh, comparing each patch to this eye. When, it, when they were identical, identical, they give 100. Uh, if, if they were not, just give the zero. So finally, uh, the one image of the face becomes a matrix of the numbers. If we can pick this, uh, if we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, this matrix can be seen on the uh, right-hand side is like a, a two white hole in a, in a, in a, in a black uh, image, which tells us that uh, uh, a human face 
basically they have a two eyes in the middle. And uh, using the similar idea, we can see that maybe for a uh, human's face, we have like a nose in the middle and we have a mouth uh, down under in the middle. So uh, we, if we can see an image, they have a such kind of features. So we have a high probability to believe this is the human face, yeah, right? So this is the idea can be used to, uh, you know, to do the facial recognition. So you can using your mobile phone and the camera, you can see a little bit, you can see a square uh, trying to locate where your faces are. And yeah, this is the uh, basically uh, the idea of the uh, convolution and the convolution neural net networks become so important in the uh, current deep learning. And uh, thanks to the deep learning, so all this uh, new technology has uh, emerged, uh, all this new technology emerges and the, like, uh, you know, um, a natural language understanding and machine translation and also a uh, different uh, kind of the, you know, a vision and the language problems. Okay, and uh, uh, we're going deep. So we designed different kinds of neural networks and the parameters from, they, they, they actually develops from the millions to the hundred millions and even billions of the uh, parameters. And they can tune to satisfy the different kind of uh, complex uh, uh, problems in the real world. And uh, this model, you know, sometimes become a pioneer uh, trying to solve different, uh, all kinds of the problem we're facing right now. And uh, for example, this is something we have done that how can we to, uh, how, how can we do the automatic painting of, um, of a cartoon, right? Uh, suppose you give a kind of, uh, 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 you know, very, uh, you know, give the cartoon image without any color, and uh, you can, uh, we can develop an algorithm that can automatically find what color it is. And uh, also, uh, this is the uh, video, I will actually, we don't have too much time to show that. Um, I will, uh, I will show the, the, this one. This is about the automatic driving, and uh, you can see uh, we can semantic uh, sorry, we can segment the image into different semantic areas. For example, the road, the building, the cars, and we can automatically using the color uh, to represent different objects like the, the pink or the rose and the green of the trees. And uh, we can later on, we can actually redesign all these colors into the, for example, the image C. Image C, we're just using these colors to recreate a different image, but this image has never seen this world. We can translate it back into the real uh, street view. And uh, if you see the uh, D, uh, the, 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 the image D, image D, it's so real, right? You can see that it's a, it's a very uh, small road. There are the car parks along the road, but this image is fake. It's never been seen anywhere in this world. It's actually been created by using the, uh, this is this, our mathematical model. So all this technology can help us to build something never happened in our physical world. So that's how our imagination will work, right? And we will see how this technology will be used in the metaverse later. And the uh, other part is the uh, uh, natural language processing. So uh, current artificial intelligence technology, we can do uh, understanding the uh, semantics behind these words. For example, you can see the, the relationship between the king and the queen is exactly the relationship between the man and woman, right? And if we represent the king, the queen, all these words in some vectors, in mathematical vectors, we can use the numerical calculation. We use the vector king minus the vector of a queen, and we plus woman that roughly equal to a man. So a uh, semantic relations in the natural language, and that can be translated into the numerical calculation in our model. So this is something, you know, when, when, whenever we can use the numerical calculation, we can use the computer, right? So that computer, so we can use the computer to understand the semantics of the uh, natural language later then. And this is, uh, I, I think that will be uh, popular for, for, for Chinese audience. And this is the uh, vector we learned from the novels from Jin Yong. And you can see these are just the characters from the novel. You can see Zhang Suishan is actually uh, very near to Xie Xun and the Zhang Wuji, okay? And th that's exactly their uh, semantic relations in the novel itself. 
you can see all these guys are grouped together because they are so close in the uh, in the original novel. And you know, all these semantic relations can be visualized, they can be actually calculated uh, by the word embedding. And uh, of course, we can use that to generate different kind of uh, commands or something like that. I will I will go through all, all the things and. Uh, uh, vision language problem is how the, the robots can see something and translate it into the language to tell you what happened exactly. And uh, we have been, been uh, building uh, such a kind of uh, really hard, you know, kind of a mathematical model trying to map the, uh, uh, the text features and the vision features into a kind of a semantic space. In this space, we can, given the word, we can find the closest image. It's given the image, we can find the closest word. And something like that. Okay, and uh, I will uh, go through these parts and talk about the uh, space without gravity. I think other speakers will talk more about the applications in the uh, metaverse. I will just a quick review and finally we'll go to uh, the final part to see why artificial intelligence is so important in the metaverse. So first of all, what is real, right? It's hard to define what is the real is. So, you know, you know, maybe uh, like a uh, 50 years ago, this is a very, it's not very hard to distinguish what is real, what is not. But today, it's pretty hard. So it's just like we are kind of living in the, uh, the world full of imagination, especially from the movies, right? From the avatars, from the, you know, the, the Lord of Rings, you see these figures are so real. And uh, welcome to the uh, Pandora, right? The Pandora is sort of, you know, uh, has been created from our brain. But, you know, this and this world is well communicated to the, all the uh, population. So that is the commun uh, that's the power of the communication. So, and if you can see that, if you understand what is Pandora is, so you, you are basically accept the concept idea, right? And this is, you can hardly to distinguish is it physically true or not. And, uh, for example, this is a famous example and also very interesting um, for the metaverse. This is some example from the turkey and uh, the cattle farm. They think that cows are kind of very stressed. So they gave them the, uh, the, 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 the glasses, the very virtual glasses, and to make them cows believe they are living in a very green pastoral. So, and they said, you know, this kind uh, 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 that will help the uh, the cows be less stressed and uh, generate more milk. So, if considering you're a, a milk, uh, you're a cow, and you have never seen anything uh, real uh, from the uh, time you were born, so basically you're living in the uh, in the world of the matrix, right? So, uh, so in this world, so imagination is the basic need for creation and uh, innovation. And our human society, we need to we need to communicate, and we need the memory, we need the imagination to uh, generate more uh, creation and innovation. And the metaverse is actually a new space, a new virtual world that help us to make our imagination is more powerful, more communicative. So this is why we think that metaverse is a kind of indispensable to our uh, future society. And because you know this is our basic need as a human being, we need to work uh, collectively, and we need to collaborating with as many people as we can that can generate uh, immense power we have never seen before. So in the metaverse, so we can actually using our our imagination to create something that never happened before, and um, that also can be uh, communicative to all the people who are living in the metaverse. That will generate some that will generate some innovations we will never seen uh, before. Okay, and um, welcome to the metaverse. And I think everybody knows the story, you know, the Zuckerberg changed the uh, Facebook to the meta. And uh, so there are possibly different kind of uh, uh, applications in the metaverse, but philosophically, we're finally uh, living in the matrix, right? Considering the uh, uh, kind of a metaphor so just like the brain living in the uh, the, the, the brain living in the bark the brain in the barcade. Uh, so uh, if your brain has been connected to different signals, and these signals can tell you the brain, you know, you're walking outside the sun, but actually you're just a brain. So uh, 
this is a very philosophical question. What is real, what is not, right? And in the metaverse, so this is the kind of uh, physical world going to meet our imagination. And uh, that uh, we'll see, you know, all these things that guiding is so real by using different kinds of technology. Uh, for example, using the augmented reality. So you consider yourself or you are going some places you've never been there. And uh, also uh, we have uh, divide, we, we can actually invent a different kind of devices and the helmets, the tablets and the phones and all these things. And that will maybe finally become the everyday thing like the mobile phones and the calculators and the computers. So we, because we have the basic desire of the, the communication of talking to different people and without any physical limitations. So um, these uh, you know, the devices will finally uh, become maybe our everyday devices. We will spend more time in the metaverse, just like we can spend more time in the internet uh, comparing to our fathers or even our grandfathers. And uh, uh, finally, like uh, let's make a kind of a summarization. So uh, in the physical world, we use language for communication. This we can consider as a human to human interaction. And when we have the internet and mobile phones, it's kind of a human to human interaction by machines, right? And virtual reality and artificial intelligence, we're trying to build a communication between human and the machine. And so this is like a human machine interaction. But finally in the metaverse, it becomes the human to human to machine by machines, right? So in the metaverse, so human may have different avatars and Maybe one human, you can see uh, one, one human, you know, uh, in the metaverse, it could be driven by artificial intelligence. So in the metaverse, you can hardly to see is the human or is the artificial intelligence. So that will be, we will say, is like a human to human to machine uh, communication by um, machines. So of course, the metaverse had to uh, built by some computer, by computers and by machines, right? And uh, okay, and uh, different applications, I will go through that very quickly. And uh, it, uh, the, it's a kind of a metaverse for people who play in the game. And we have Minecraft and Roblox and Animal Crossing. And uh, finally, metaverse become very useful. For example, Mercedes use that to uh, doing some car fixing, and uh, car repairs. Uh, and also some medical doctors, they are trying to uh, build different kinds of long distance surgery uh, using this um, uh, kind of uh, virtual reality devices. And also for sale and uh, uh, some digital person has been invented. They have a kind of a perfect personality. They never uh, doing anything. They, they never have any scandals. So, and uh, especially the young generation, they like this kind of a digital human so much. And for training, uh, this is, has been used for quite a long time to training the pilot, to training the uh, uh, drivers. And also um, I think metaverse is a big plus for the designers. So they can go beyond the uh, physical limitations. They can design the buildings and you know houses, whatever they want in this virtual world. And with the help of the blockchain technology, especially in the Web3 and uh, you know, all these digital properties can be protected that will make designers and artists you know, so happy uh, to work in the metaverse. Okay, and the performances and uh, especially in Korea, and they have uh, done some concert using only the digital human. It's just happening right now and working uh, because of the COVID. So I think everybody kind of got used to using a kind of long distance uh, conferences and uh, online video call and all this stuff. And we can actually have a virtual office over there and uh, education. And you can building a different kind of your world. It's just like the Minecraft, you can build in your world using uh, this code. Okay. And uh, if, if we want to metaverse become real, so we need a kind of infrastructure, we need the tools, or we need this technology, we need economics, we need the protocols, how the human can communicate and interact in this metaverse. And even the human sometimes could be digital. And uh, okay, finally, let's meet the future. So uh, in general, when we look into the future, so we can go back to uh, about, and this is about a hundred years ago, 
at, at that time, the people trying to pre to predict what the future will look look like in the year two thousand. And this is, I think, that's the uh, newspaper from. Uh, I think that was from the nineteen fifty something. So that time, people invented television. So they think maybe we can uh, watch newspaper, uh, read newspaper from television. And this is like uh, one. Uh, I think nineteen hundred. Uh, the French artists the, the trying to predict that in the year 2000, we can do the long distance video call. And uh, of course, this new kind of invention, like a robot can clean the, the, the floor and uh, we can using the speech recognition to uh, write, to print out your, your, your speech. And interestingly, that uh, all, all these dreams come true uh, using the information technology. So basically, if we uh, look um, into the future, so if the metaverse is the kind of unlimited space that will uh, release all of our human imagination and to, uh, to generate more creativity and innovation. And artificial intelligence is so important because you know today we're trying to build in the robot using artificial intelligence, but this physical robot has many, many limitations, right? And it's pretty hard to, um, to maintain. They need to uh, obey all these physical laws, right? But you know, for digital human or digital robot, we don't have a, such a problem, right? So, you, for example, and uh, the, the people using a lot of energy are spent like a decade trying to develop the, the robots can can walk using the four legs. This is the uh, the you know this is the big dog from the Boston the, 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 the dynamics, and in the metaverse, you know the human they don't even need the legs; they're just floating from one place to another, right? And we what what really of uh, uh, what, what, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. What, what really uh, we want to do is basically uh, using our imagination, right? And uh, how to communicate, how to communicate to ourselves very, uh, how to communicate effectively. So we don't really care, you know, how we walk, right? All these very uh, fundamental uh, functions. And even in the metaverse, we don't have to eat, we don't have to sleep, right? So all these physical limitations has been eliminated into the, uh, in the metaverse. So, and in the metaverse, and the, we made all these algorithms to helping us, uh, to help us in the uh, real world can have a kind of avatar. So, you know, even the Siri can be more humanized so we can be friends with him or with her. So uh, that's how, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, will this is the role that artificial intelligence will play in the future um, metaverse. So I like the movie of the free guy. So in the, finally in the metaverse, you can meet a lot of people and some people, uh, you, you can now tell is this is a real one or not because all behind the avatars, that could be a real human, but sometimes that could be a just artificial intelligence, right? In the movie of free guy and these NPCs, which is non-player character, they kind of have a, a self-awareness and he don't want to be an uh, AI anymore. But in an ideal metaverse, so we have to use some AI to uh, create these NPCs. So in this metaverse, there has to be a waiters and the waitresses, and they, um, they uh, you know, all these very basic need of the human society. Uh, we can using the virtual robot to do this. And but in our physical world, we need to eat, right? There has to be farmers. And we when you go to the restaurant, there has to be waiters. But it seems like nobody want to be a waiter or waitress or even a farmer to work so hard to feed other people, right? But in the metaverse, we can use this virtual robot to finish all these very basic needs for human being. Um, but the real human, they have the avatars in this metaverse, uh, they can actually do more interesting thing or more creative, more innovative things. And uh, by such a kind of uh, large scale large scale collaboration, uh, we may actually invent something uh, really big, uh, something really uh, very innovative. Okay, and uh, probably we can even uh, grow up some, you know, a collective intelligence. And because it's a such large scale, the human mind, uh, by, by, by such a kind of a collaboration of a human mind, we may generate something uh, really, uh, we call the human, uh, we call the, su the super mind. That super mind that may solve the problems we haven't solving uh, in our physical world, for example, the uh, social inequality and uh, you know wars or whatever. Yeah, but but we are very kind of uh, optimistic about such a future. So uh, such a super, super mind can help us to um, 
to solve the uh, you know the, some diff very difficult problem so far. Uh, we haven't solved it yet, and uh, uh, I think other speakers will speak. Will talk more about the using the blockchain and Web three, and how we can uh, uh, to keep you know to protect our digital properties and how we use the bitcoins and, and other cryptocurrencies in the metaverse. And uh, and I believe that the real metaverse has to build uh, based on such a technology because we need a kind of a protocols in this metaverse and uh, but. This metaverse doesn't belong to any people, doesn't belong to any government, uh, belong to any uh, particular institution. So we need a very decentralized system and the protocols that make our people, so, so that make, 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 make us to collaborate into uh, in this uh, virtual world. And uh, finally, and I hope I didn't uh, run out my time. So the metaverse is coming. Uh, with the uh, uh, significance of the uh, virtual reality and the cryptocurrency and the Web3, and especially from my pers perspective, the artificial intelligence, the future is here. Uh, for the metaverse, so we uh, definitely need a lot of the AI technology, uh, trying to build the infrastructure, maybe trying to build the uh, community, uh, the, the, the real traffic or the way they move or the way they communicate in the metaverse. So, and uh, that is basically a why so AI is important in the metaverse and we're kind of very optimistic about the metaverse. They can actually um, release our huge human imagination and set up more, even larger scale of the collaboration and to um, make our humankind more creative and innovative. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And that's basically what I'm trying to talk today. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Qin. Uh, when you're talking about the perfect salesman, I was thinking maybe we can create a perfect politician in the future so we don't have so many scandals. And, uh, now, uh, thank you for a fascinating uh, you know, summary of the history of communication and development into today's metaverse. And I think next on our program, we'll go more of a deep dive uh, of the technology and its impact. So from China, we're going to go to, uh, to Los Angeles on the West Coast. And uh, our next speaker is the world's best known and the most prolific metaverse blogger consultant and author, uh, working at James O. Oh. James lives in Los Angeles, as I said, and I discovered him from a CBC interview. He is uh, the author of The Making of the Second Life and another book that's coming out about the metaverse. James is very well known and has been featured by such major news outlets like uh, ABC, BBC, CBC, The New York Times, and The Washington Post, and so on. And James will talk about a wide range of, of applications and impact the universe has or will have on our work, our life, and society. So James, over to you. Hey there. Thank you so much. Is my audio coming through OK? Uh, yeah. Good. I will share the screen. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Let's. Do a share screen, and I think we're in. Yeah, so my talk is uh, called Why the Metaverse Matters. And um, as you mentioned, I, as Andy mentioned, I'm author of Make It a Second Life, and I've been writing the Metaverse blog, New World Note, since uh, 2006, which uh, surprises me. But yeah, I wanted to jump into a very concrete understanding of the metaverse as it was conceived 30 years ago and as it exists now and uh let's see my yeah okay so let's start with the definition it's taken directly from the novel snow crash which conceived the term uh, of the metaverse which is the metaverse is a vast immersive virtual world simultaneously accessible by millions of people through vr and other devices highly customizable avatars, and powerful cr experience creation tools. It is integrated with the real world economy and external technology. The reason why I, italic I italicize other devices because um, 
the metaverse as originally conceived was never meant to be completely VR. That's kind of a an assumption a lot of people make is it's you have to be in VR, but no, that's never been how, as it's been uh, conceived. So to take a look at the current market penetration based on that definition that I just made, there's roughly about 500 million people, monthly active users that use platform, a software platform that fits that rough definition. And there's a chart there. So you're going to be talking about, as our last speaker mentioned, uh, Roblox fits that rough definition that has uh, many hundreds of millions of users. Uh, Fortnite Creative is another big one. And it will extend to different ones like VR Chat, Rec Room, and even uh, Second Life, which is where I got my start. Uh, and let's talk about the addressable market of what, who could use the metaverse now and would be most interested in it. I, I did some uh, consulting with Forrester Research. They just did a paper on the metaverse and uh, they estimated, and this is my estimation that I gave them, it's, it's about one in four people that are internet users because Basically, like I mentioned with my definition, or well, the definition based on a snow crash, is uh, it's immersive. It, it's it's a three D graphics. So basically, it looks and interacts, and 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 a certain level is a three uh, D game experience, three D online game experience. So it's people who play video games on Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo Switch, or on Steam. And so that's a, it's a portion of the, the people who are online. It's about one in four. And those are the people who are going to be most interested in, in the metaverse, metaverse platforms. So, yeah, that's, uh, we might see other adoption, but that's, that's the market that we're sure is going to be interested in immersive applications. So thinking about that, let's talk about uh, use cases for metaverse platforms. We'll start from core use cases where we can see tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of people to niche use cases, which we'll get to later. But uh, the, the main core use case for a metaverse platform is gonna be game development and game-driven socialization. So basically what makes a metaverse platform unique is it's a shared 3D space and you're in the same immersive space as millions of people and you have the content tools to create basically any experience if it really fits the definition. And what is generally created is games and game-like experiences. It could be a game as complex as Portal, the, uh, the, classic, uh, half, uh, the classic game from Valve that uh, Roblox created a version of that for the Roblox users, or it could be kind of a, a fun, very casual game like hide and seek. But that's kind of the power of a metaverse platform is you're in the same space with a bunch of people and you really, it's a, it's a, a creative play space. So you can kind of imagine whatever you want and you can create the most casual game to the most very kind of hardcore game. I, I mentioned this on my blog. The most popular Roblox experiences are more popular than the most uh, successful games on Steam. Steam is the, the top platform for uh, game distribution online. But you have people that are like just random people, like college kids, high school kids even, who create experiences on Roblox and they're even more popular. It has like tens of millions of users playing Roblox games. So that's very important because uh, the game industry is, is very massive. What you look at, if you look at metaverse platforms like Roblox, Fortnite, VRChat, and so on, is that uh, grassroots users are creating games that compete with this math massive industry that competes with big companies like Sony and and uh, Valve 
and Microsoft and so on. So that's worth keeping in mind. Another core use case is entertainment and education and live music. I wrote about this recently. This is a, uh, there's a museum in Luxembourg that's financed by the city of Luxembourg. And they were looking for ways to, to engage audiences outside of the actual museum in Luxembourg. And so they, they created, it was first on Second Life and then they moved it to Roblox, which was a, a recreation of, of uh, Luxembourg you know, in the in 19th century. And they created a simulation of that. And I just checked back with the creator. It's had almost a million users uh, that have come by to visit. And this is likely very much where I would see the actual museum in Luxembourg. But uh, that's, one ver that's one use case in this broad category. Of course, live music is another category where people will uh, create an avatar that looks like a rock star or a you know folk music star and perform live and you could stream the video or just uh, have their avatar perform music and the audio is, is uh, streamed out to people watching and so you have that as an experience and yeah that's uh, very popular across all kinds of editors platforms. James, excuse me, uh, for some reason, there's a bar on top of your screen that block your title there. Oh. Uh, I can't do anything from my end, just wondering if you could do something. The top of my screen is blocked? Uh, the top title is blocked. Uh, why oh. if you could move well, I think I have to... Um... Hmm. Yeah, there's a bar on top of this bar on the right side of your screen too. Hmm. Did you see it? Let's see. What's well, I I see the um the user interface. Oh, let me see. Does that work? Okay. Yeah, you got rid of the top. Oh, of good. Can you no, get, sorry can about you get that. rid of the one on the on the right side too? There you go. How's that? Uh, much better. Uh, yeah, there's a little left over uh, at the bottom and also on the top right corner. Hmm. Okay. Let's move this down and to the side. Okay. There we come a square now. Uh, all right. I think at least it's, uh, yeah, it's better. All right. Thanks. Okay. Good. So, uh, uh, let's talk about niche use cases of metaverse platforms. So retail shopping, which include fashion and housewares, basically because on a metaverse platform, it's highly immersive. So you have a sense that you're in the, the 3D space. So you have a sense of, of geography of, of your surroundings and you can visualize that in comparison to the real world, and this makes it possible to prototype fashion and and housewares and interior design because you can visualize, for example, what uh, if if you wanted to customize your real world apartment or house, and you could create a model of it, and you could have fashion imported to or a uh, furniture imported to see what different configurations of your apartment would look like. Similar to your avatar, because when you have, uh, when you're in a metaverse platform, you have a, a strong affinity to your avatar. So if you have clothing items on your avatar, you can see what it looks like and then you can also feel an affinity uh, of what that looks like versus how it might look like in the real world. So. That's an interesting application that I, I think people will experiment with of like, let's try different fashion styles and see what they are like in a virtual space and then think about whether you want to buy them in, in the real world. So lots of, lots of big companies are, are interested in that. Uh, Fiorucci is a, a major Italian brand that's been experimenting with it, but you've seen a lot of that like in a Roblox, there's 
many applications or many fashion brands that are, are experimenting with it. Another niche case is a uh, use case of metaverse platforms, healthcare applications. It's being used, and I, I think the previous speaker mentioned this, um, as training in, in healthcare and training in, uh, in the operation theater and also in therapy and what you can have in a space because uh, again, by definition, a metaverse platform is it, you have online users from all over the world is that you can have them in the same simulated operating theater or therapy space. And so you can train them in, in different procedures and in, in across the medical spectrum. And so that's very interesting. And then also in therapy, uh, shown in, in many uh, peer-reviewed studies, if you put someone in a VR experience, for example, someone experiencing burn trauma, if you create a simulation of snow, that it actually makes them feel less uh, painful in the real world, like their, their burn sensations go down. So that's really powerful. And then if you, if you create a social element on top of it, it will add a layer where people can, like for example, if people uh, who've suffered, suffered uh, bird traumas from all over the world can inter interact with each other, they can communicate and share their experience. So that's also very powerful. Another niche use case is architecture and urban planning. This is one I wrote about a, a few years ago it was called Wikitecture, and it was created by an architect. Uh, he originally used Second Life, but this could be applied to uh, new metaverse platforms where he was designing buildings and, and different urban landscapes where it was uh, instantly editable. So you could have people looking at it and saying, well, I, I don't think this path works here. Uh, this might be a, a, a hurdle for different, and you could, based on the immediate social interactions of people in the space virtually, change it in real time. So almost like, you know, like if you're prototyping a model in, in blocks or Legos, but you could have people again from all over the world give feedback on the overall design, and and that's what a metaverse platform makes possible. Another niche use case is uh, virtual pets uh, companionship. Uh, this uh, on your right is a is a study. I, I think the professor is based in uh, one of the UC systems in California. She created uh, virtual pets with her team that respond to people, and uh, in the virtual space of VR chat, also a metaverse platform that uh, like respond to being petted. You know, if you have a, a VR headset on and a, a rig, they'll respond to being petted and follow you around. You can even throw a stick and they'll, they'll play with you. And that's really interesting. Uh, she kind of created to study how people were feeling uh, during the pandemic. This was uh, last year. Actually, it was 2020, uh, where many or most people were in quarantine lockdown. and created this as a way of people to have some kind of engagement uh, outside the uh, apartment that they were confined in. And I think in future use cases, we'll see that uh, being considered for senior citizens, other people that are disabled and confined to their space, but they could uh, go in a metaverse platform and have a virtual pet. and. You know, I, uh, I I have a an opinion where I look at metaverse technology as being uh, good and bad. So the good application is, in this case, you could have uh, be, people who are housebound being able to engage with their virtual pet and also other virtual pet owners in, in a virtual space. And that's really good if they're confined 
to their place in the real world. But, uh, you know, the, there would be a temptation socially to give uh, housebound people a metaverse platform and say, well, just go ahead and interact with your virtual pet and we're not going to take care of you beyond that. So that's going to be a danger. We've seen that with uh, robotics in Japan. There's been introduction of robotic pets to senior citizens, which is good in the sense that it provides some kind of social comfort to uh, senior citizens and ill people. But uh, there's going to be a temptation to just say, well, that's, that's all we need to give you. And so that should be a serious discussion we have in the next few years. Another new niche use case of a metaverse platforms, and I kind of call this the quiet application, national events. I say quiet because it's not given a lot of coverage, but uh, this happened when I was working at Second Life very early on. Uh, the military approached uh, Liddy Lab and started discussing about uh, potential national defense applications. Like, could we simulate combat in a virtual world uh, uh, on a metaverse platform? Or could we simulate training? And so that's a very interesting case. Uh, there's on the, on, the, on, the, on the one part of the spectrum is going to be national defense. On the other spectrum is what you're reading about here is uh, virtual therapy for uh, troops who are experiencing, veterans who are experiencing uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Where, and this is a, a, a use case we've seen for over a decade at least in the U.S., as uh, troops here came back from Afghanistan and Iraq, is they wanted a space where they could engage with other veterans that where they felt safe and had relative degree of an anonymity, where they could talk about issues they're, they're experiencing since coming back from war. And so uh, the U.S. Army, NATO, other military, military organizations have been experimenting with metaverse platforms to help people recover from PTSD and give them a social space where they can be with their, uh, their fellow veterans, which uh, might be difficult in the real world because, you know, uh, for veterans, admitting PTSD can, can be uh, quite a social challenge because they don't want to admit they have it or they're uncomfortable. So a metaverse platform could create that opportunity for them to seek recovery. Another uh, use case, I'd say this is the least use case is uh, business meetings. This was discussed by the previous speaker where you can have, instead of Zoom, like we're on now, where it's all on video, we can all create avatars and go into a 3D meeting space. And so, so it's a, a metaverse platform where you could have a, a virtual event, a virtual conference, have your avatar move around, customize your avatar. Uh, I, cust I uh, consulted for a called Break Room. That's their specialty is, is having, me, having conferences for people in the real world, especially during the pandemic, to instead have it on a metaverse platform. So what you're looking at now is a talk I gave with uh, Matthew Ball, probably the most well-known uh, kind of evangelist, consultants on metaverse technology. And I gave a talk with him. <clears throat> and while the audience was listening, uh, because a metaverse is infinitely malleable, people were, the uh, developers were, kind of customizing the world around us. So a garden kind of emerged around us as we were talking and different items. There's a giant blue frog. Uh, it makes, makes the live experience much more engaging, interesting, and memorable. Uh, we, in 3D, just kind of pull the camera back and think about why, why is this even important at all is... Uh, as humans, we, we tend to remember and process knowledge in, in three dimensions. And even if that's the, the uh, three-dimensional space of our mind. So to create a virtual 
uh, recreation of how we think what might be called a memory palace is very powerful. And so having a, having a meeting in a, in a virtual space like this, you're going to have a similar, in terms of audio, it's going to be similar to what you'll have in Zoom. But because it's in 3D, it'll be more memorable. Uh, oh, let me move the uh, thing. Uh, like I said at the bottom here, I think this is going to be a short-term use case in the sense that I, I don't think it's going to be something that people do all the time. But when it's as easy as clicking a link in Slack and saying, all right, let, let's go into our virtual metaverse meeting space and we'll have a 30-minute meeting with our employees from all over the world. I think that will be very powerful, um, especially as post-pandemic, we become more and more spread out across the world as we were. And we're working from home, so we'll want a, uh, a virtual office cooler kind of environment, a more casual, personal, social environment. And that's where metaverse platforms can, can work. Another niche use case that's uh, uh, very interesting. Like I said, the definition of the metaverse taken from the original definition from Snow Crash is that there's going to be ability to control the virtual space from external devices. So uh, through robotics, through other hardware from within the metaverse. So this is a project that I wrote about on my blog recently, a, a Japanese inventor. He's creating, in VR chat. he's creating a way for his VR chat avatar to control a real-world robot. I, you'll see in this photo, he's a, it's like a small robot, but he eventually wants to control an eight-foot robot from within his avatar in VR chat, which just might seem like kind of a crazy, wild, uh, fun stunt, but... Uh, as I reported a couple of weeks ago, if you can control a robot from the metaverse, you could take that robot and go into a very dangerous space in the real world. So take that robot into a burning fire or have that robot control heavy equipment. Uh, a Japanese company is doing that with a VR headset right now, uh, controlling just you know, like 20 ton objects moving around with a robot and they're doing that through a VR headset that's hooked up uh, in a, into a virtual landscape, like an XR landscape of the same space. But doing it from the metaverse is quite uh, achievable. That's happening in VR chat. Uh, uh, but uh, this was part of uh, what was envisioned by Neil Stevenson in Snow Crash was, uh, it, it was one of my favorite parts of the novel is uh, one of the heroes is talking with this guy who looks like he's in a uh, he, in the metaverse. He's this uh, very patrician looking guy in a Vietnamese mansion. And then she realizes later on that he's actually a survivor of the Vietnam War and he's horribly bruised and uh, you know crippled and he's in a uh, he's in a, a life support system and he's hooked up into the metaverse and he's in the metaverse but he's able to drive a van in the real world so he's able from the metaverse to navigate through the real world which I thought was very powerful because it was like wow you could uh, once we had enough computing power, connect pe people no matter uh, what their condition, if they're physically disabled or whatever, connect them to devices that could take them uh, beyond, you know, where they are at home through a metaverse platform into the real world. So that's another application that's being worked on. Finally, or I think it's finally, Another niche use case, or it could be larger, is just religious and spiritual events. What you're looking at right now on the screen, this is, as uh, far as I know, the one of the first uh, baptisms 
by a real church in VRChat, one of the uh, leading new metaverse platforms. This guy, uh, Soto7, he's actually a, uh, he's a minister in real life. And he has a he has a church in real life, and he decided to create a branch of that in VR chat. And he started giving baptisms in VR chat. And uh, I talked with him about that. Like, what are the theological implications? You're you know you're doing it on in 3D graphics with a VR headset on, and how how actually holy is this to you? And, you know, he kind of says something that's similar to me. I'm not religious, but it's more about the social experience. It's like if there are a group of people, a group of believers together sharing the same experience, that's, uh, that, is, that is spiritual. I mean, it's uh, kind of what Jesus says in the Bible, where two or more are gathered, there I am, there I am. So if, if a metaverse experiences is... Uh, if a metaverse experience is sufficiently social, then yes, I, I suppose if you are religious, you could have whole religious uh, ceremonies in a metaverse platform, especially, like I said, at the bottom here for uh, seniors and people who are housebound. So that's another application to think about. So having thought of all of that, uh, we should talk about some of the hurdles. I. I've never been like a full on evangelist of the metaverse. Like uh, I'm very skeptical of people who say, well, this is gonna change everything or this is the future of the internet. I think it's a part of the future of the internet. Like I mentioned uh, early on, it's probably gonna be one in four of the experiences that we see in the internet are gonna be metaverse related. You know, we're still gonna use our cell phones or we're still gonna be on Twitter. We're still gonna be on, uh, Maybe not Facebook, but certainly uh, TikTok applications like that. But there were there will be full-on 3D immersive experiences in metaverse platforms. So there are hurdles. Uh, the first one, security. A lot of the real-world applications, for example, military, for sure, security is going to be a prime issue. Um, Definition of a metaverse platform, like I said, it's going to be accessible by tens of millions of people, just massively accessible. But I've, I've, I've consulted, I've worked on metaverse platforms. If you talk to a big company, a Fortune 500 company, let alone a government, the first thing they're going to ask you is, can I put this behind our firewall? So what will often happen is a metaverse company will give them a copy of the metaverse software for them to use on, on the private side of the firewall. So that raises the question of whether it's a metaverse or it's just metaverse technology. And I, I think that'll be an ongoing issue. It's basically any real world application, even architecture, because you know there's a lot of concerns around IP protection. Anything that might be accessible, especially through hackers, is gonna bring up the question of, well, how can we put this beyond behind our firewalls? So security is the issue. Second major one is user friction, both uh, tech, technical and the user experience. Like I said, the, the main adopter of metaverse technology are gonna be people who are already familiar with immersive 3D experiences. And that basically tends to be gamers, people who are on the Xbox a lot, or people use Steam a lot. And that's only a, a section of people, but if you've tried to show a metaverse platform to people outside that, and I've done that a lot, uh, <clears throat> many or most people get immediately confused by a full immersive 3D experience. It's like, uh, who, what am I doing? Where am I going? Uh, introducing the concept of an, av of an avatar of this, uh, like 3D representation of a person that's supposed to be you, but for most people, they don't understand that concept. It's becoming more mass market, especially for Gen Y and Gen Z. But uh, the majority of people don't understand the concept of an avatar. So that's a main user friction. 
So that's a challenge to think about. Finally, the metaverse, what I call the metaverse age cliff. And you'll see that across metaverse, metaverse platforms that have a mass market. Roblox, Fortnite Creative, VR Chat, Rec Room, Core. The main user base is teenagers and people in their early, early 20s. If you look at the demographic usage, it drops off very sharply after about 24. For various, very you know, common sense reasons, people start going out. They want to go on dates. They want to go to parties in the real world. So uh, that's going to be an ongoing challenge. I, I think going forward, especially with Gen Y, Gen Z, they're going to always keep metaverse platforms as part of one of their experience uh, avenues online, but it's probably not going to be the only one because more than anything, being in VR chat or Roblox or, or Rec Room or whatever, it just takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time to, you know, download the software, log in, get acclimated to the 3D experience. That like, we're already talking about 30 minutes to just get started and acclimated. And then enjoying experiences, you're talking about hour or two hours. So it's very time consuming. That's part of the power. When, when you get acclimated and immersed, the experience is much more uh, memorable and, and, and resonant, but it, it's quite time consuming. So as people get older, they have kids, they have jobs that are very demanding. Uh, most of the people in that age bracket over you know, the late 20s, they, they start using metaverse platforms less. So. Uh, that might change, but we don't know. That's actually a question I'm working on in my next book is how do we get past the metaverse age gap? Is it a matter of, of maturing these platforms or do we just assume that for the most part, the young people, which would be totally fine. I would rather have young people in a, a interactive uh, creative space where they're encouraged to be creative and they're encouraged to explore their identity than just watching passively Netflix. So that's something to consider and we'll see what happens in the next five, 10 years. That kind of covers the basics. Uh, and yeah, this is my first book, uh, The Making of Second Life, which I wrote in 2008 or came out in 2008. Uh, Second Life was always conceived as, or at the beginning it was conceived as a, uh, as a matter of, and kind of took a lot of those concepts. So uh, I always say this is anything you see in news about the metaverse now has been experienced uh, in Second Life back in 2003 to 2010, let's say. So if you're curious what's going to happen in the future, look to the recent past. So that's my book. I'm on Twitter as SL Hamlet. And my blog, Metaverse Blog, like I said, been around since 2006, New World Notes, nwn.blogs.com. And, and uh, uh, like was mentioned, I will be announcing a new book shortly. So hope you connect and hope you ask questions afterward. Be glad to help out. But thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, James. You asked quite a few of the real life applications. Uh, and <laughs> I, I noticed in the chat somebody commented, you know, uh, people are glad that when people are getting older, they get out of the metaverse and get into real life. That's probably a good thing. And there will yeah. be a lot more discussion on that part. Uh, you know, our final speaker, uh, uh, we have a psychologist here. She is she specializes in that part of the metaverse. So I, I think we'll continue uh, without a break. If you want to take a quick break, just you know, do your own thing. Uh, and uh, we'd like to continue with our presentation here. So, uh, and our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Anna Lomanowska. She is a research scientist and educator in psychology and in neuroscience. And she's the founder and director of the Digital Wellbeing Lab. 
uh, adjunct professor of psychology to Laval <laughs> Oh, sorry. I'm not showing up. All right, I'm just trying to. Sorry, let me introduce Dr. Anna uh, Romanowski. She's a research scientist and educator in psychology and neuroscience, and uh, director of the Digital Wellbeing Lab, adjunct professor of psychology at Laval University, and a former assistant professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. Uh, she conducts research and speaks about social interactions in the digital age, including at uh, TED TEDx U of T. Uh, she's particularly interested in how people navigate social interactions in the virtual worlds and how new technologies can, can be used to aid social interaction and personal well-being. Dr. Namnowska, take it away. Hi, good evening, everyone, and good morning if you're um, in, uh, in China. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Andy, for, for the introduction. And I'm just uh, sharing my screen here. Just want to make sure that you can all see that. I don't blame um, yep. I think um, there's someone who's uh, not muted there. I hear a voice in the background. I think um, uh, the previous speaker, thank you. <laughs> That's great. And um, uh, so the last part of, of tonight, we're going to talk a little bit more about the human side of the uh, metaverse. So that's the goal for today. And um, the questions that I would like to um, consider is what are the impacts of the metaverse on us as humans, our human well-being? And to think of this in the context of what is different about the uh, metaverse and what is similar to uh, the technologies that are currently in existence. And finally, to think about and look at some benefits and challenges of the metaverse um, that we can foresee for human well-being. So we've been spending a lot of time talking about the metaverse and in the metaverse, and we're going to now take a look at the human who is in the metaverse and take them out of the metaverse and look at what are some of the impacts on human well-being of um, you know, using this, this type of technology, being immersed in this type of technology. So some areas that uh, people are often concerned about uh, relate to mental health. So impacts on the impact on emotions, attention, um, cognition, how we, um, there's a lot of discussion about uh, the way technology impacts our, um, say depression and youth, anxiety, um, our ability to pay attention and not be distracted by things around us to who we are and our identity and how we develop identity of being in the virtual world. There is also discussion about uh, how being in a virtual uh, reality, how that might interact, uh, interact with our sort of real reality and our interactions in the real world. Um, and there's a lot of discussion around the idea of being isolated and um, lonely due to engaging more so in the virtual environment than the real world. A sense of detachment from society, from others around you, and potentially a loss of social skills that you would need in the real world. So these are some, some issues that people are often concerned about when they talk about any sort of digital technologies, but especially those that are more immersive. And of course, there's also the issue around physical health. So, being in, immersed in a vir virtual environment, uh, even though with VR, it does enable some more movement than um, other types of technologies, but still it is still limited in terms of movement, can also interfere with sleep. We know that uh, people spend a lot of time online playing video games, for instance, um, and even just in social media will tend to, uh, that may disrupt their sleep because they're so engaged that they just don't you know, go to sleep as, as early as they should, for instance, especially for teens, issues around eye health and other, other physical considerations. So these are just a, a few of the issues that we may be concerned about when we're talking about um, the, you know, the metaverse, but also other technologies that we are currently using. So where I wanted to start is to look at how the metaverse is similar and how it's different to the current technology that's out there. And as many of the speakers have already mentioned, um, the metaverse is already 
out there. It's already being used in the context of the many video games, virtual worlds that people are already engaging in. And more and more, this is now also be, um, involving virtual reality. So uh, when we think of the, the metaverse, I, I really like the term, and I think this was actually used by Mark Zuckerberger. He called um, the metaverse an embodied internet. So it's basically what we are, you know, the technology we're currently using, but allowing us to actually enter into it in a more multi-sensory way. So that's how I would like to conceptualize the next little bit of the presentation to look at um, how is this new embodied internet similar and how is it different from what we are used to at this point. So when we think of the internet in our daily lives, so all the different apps that we use, I often do this exercise anytime I give a talk. I look at the pros and cons of the different, different technologies that people use, especially social media or, or gaming. So certainly with the internet, there are so many benefits for us. We, are, we use it because it provides so, many, so much access to other people, to connecting, to uh, solving lots of problems. You know, when we think about Google Maps, for instance, it's amazing that we can just get around in a completely um, new city with the help of this technology. That's just one example. So some of the things that we really love about technology do make our lives easier and allow us to connect. And even here with all of you tonight, um, we are connecting around the world and speaking and discussing the same topics. So uh, this is, you know, the, some of the most exciting aspects of technology. And of course, there are the, the cons of daily technology use that often have to do with uh, distraction, our inability to sort of disconnect, getting hooked on, on social media, you know, some of the issues around teens getting, um, uh, you know, social comparison to others and how they uh, develop their identity, um, develop eventually depression around who they are. And, and uh, so all these issues that we often hear about, um, it seems like we often complain about young people, but certainly <laughs> adults and older people uh, have concerns around how uh, technologies affect their productivity and, and their ability to engage etc. So this is certainly not a, a problem for just one generation. We are all sort of dealing with this um, issue of finding a balance in the digital world. So some of these, these issues already exist in our, our daily internet. Um, and here's, a I like to put this chart up, it's a nice summary of how, how to think about um, our sort of the pros and cons of the technologies that we use. So for instance, when it comes to social media, if you take any social media um, app, you can identify some of the positive and some of the negative aspects of it, right? So we have with Instagram and, and I have some, some of the social media platforms, Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter here. There are some issues around, you know, how it may affect sleep, body image, anxiety, depression, but then there are lots of positives around how people can express themselves, get support, get social support, build communities. So we see that with um, these, diff these types of technologies that have emerged, we have this um, you know, this duality around it, that there are certainly pros and, and cons to it. Now, one um, approach to sort of looking at this that I, I like is called the Goldilocks hypothesis. And when we ask about how screens and, and digital technologies affect our well-being, this is an approach that I, um, I think is quite explanatory for what is happening. And this is based on the study of um, adolescents, um, but there's a whole lot of them, 120,000 adolescents who answered surveys about their well-being and screen use. And what emerged was that there is this, um, what we call an inver inver inverted U relationship when it comes to well-being and screen use. In that, for, for those who don't use screens at all, their well-being is a little bit lower. And you can see that here um, when their daily screen use is, is zero, their well-being is lower, and then as screen use goes up, well-being goes up, but then as screen use goes down, uh, sorry, um, screen use uh, goes up, well-being goes down. So this idea that if we don't have access to these technologies, we may not be actually even able to engage with our peers. This is especially relevant for adolescents. Uh, and here I have it um, displayed according to different types of technologies. So the idea is that no use is, um, worse for well-being, moderate use is better, and then ex excessive use is again worse. So this idea of a perfect sort of balance between usage like uh, Goldilocks, you know, choosing <laughs> the bowl that's perfect for, for her, not too big, not too small. So I think this is a really, you know, important thing to keep in mind as we 
uh, discuss the benefits and, and challenges of digital technologies in our lives, that there is sort of a, a balanced and optimal way of using them. And often um, this has been portrayed as this balance between being online and offline, you know, maybe you should only spend two hours on screens if you're a child. And obviously, you know, for adults, most of us do work on, use screens in our day, day lives for work. So people try to, you know, balance this out between online and offline time. But another way also to look at it is to balance what, um, what you're doing when you are online. Um, so whether you're engaging with um, apps and, and um, social media that are useful to you that um, cultivate some, you know, positive, positive things in your life, or whether you're getting sort of drawn into the rabbit hole and maybe binging on, on Netflix or, or getting into arguments on social media. Um, so this idea of, you know, technology itself and how we use it, there's an aspect of balance to what we choose to do when we are online. So I think these ideas that um, you know we've been now grappling with for the past two or two decades or so are still quite relevant when we are starting to think about expanding into the metaverse. And I, I like to um, put this up. This is um, from the Digital Wellness Institute that I was a part of a while back, and I contributed to creating this this tool called the Digital Flourishing Wheel. And there's a lot of information here that you see, but the idea is that. When we think about well-being in the digital age and flourishing as humans in the digital age, um, we have to consider that technology is part of all aspects of our lives. It's part of our work, it's part of our entertainment, it's part of our social interactions. So when we look at well-being in the context of technology, no matter which technology we're talking about, um, you know, it's important to consider how we can optimize its use for the different uh, parts of our lives. So we have relationships, communication, our environment, um, productivity, and then also things around digital citizenship. Um, quantified self relates to how we use technology to, to understand ourselves and our bodies. Our physical health uh, can, you know, we can use technology to support that as well. Uh, but also, you know, we need to unplug once in a while as well. And of course, mental health. So there are um, a lot of, you know, the literature right now looking at problems around the influence of technology use on well-being and health really do focus on these different aspects because it, is, it really is integrated into all aspects of our lives. So with that background of, you know, what is our current understanding of well-being and technology, I wanted to move now into the metaverse. What is different about the metaverse um, that, you know, we haven't necessarily had much experience with yet? And it's this embodied component. So, um, now, before we, we talk about what's different, what has obviously emerged in these presentations and the previous speakers who have um, told, about, told us about the metaverse is that really the metaverse has been around for quite some time. It's just the tools that we're using to access it are changing a bit. So as um, the previous speaker talked about Second Life, this was launched almost 20 years ago, 2003. So this, this amazing world, this virtual world that um, is still around, is still accessible. I actually spent a, a big portion of my research studying um, interactions in Second Life. And um, they, had a, they have an economy, people sell digital products there, um, lots of you know, different uses for this virtual world. And there's a lot of hype about it in the early 2000s and sort of, you know, then um, it, sort of plateaued in terms of usage, but you know, we're coming back to that, that hype and um, coming back to integrating more sort of real world things into a virtual world. So of course, what is new now is that we have these uh, technological devices that can connect us more easily, effective, effectively, and more accessibly to the metaverse or to a virtual environment. So we are now able to um, get, have that sense of immersion more easily because of these technologies, right? So we've had VR has been around for the idea of VR has been around, been around for, for decades, but the technology now has gotten much cheaper and faster and the resolution is so much better. Um, so it really does feel like you're in that uh, world. So, you know, this is where that embodiment is a lot easier now to facilitate with these different tools. So in a sense, uh, as you've heard already tonight, the metaverse combines this idea of, you know, what, how we've conceptualized the metaverse for, for several decades now but around the virtual world, plus the development of these amazing tools, plus the components of social media and these social media companies that are, are now obviously playing a big role. 
as well as all of the other sort of um, economic aspects to it around owning uh, virtual um, goods, uh, NFTs and things like that. So it's really this culmination of all these technologies that are now, now coming together to create this, this new space. But what does that mean for, for us humans, um, for our human bodies in a sense and our human minds? So fundamentally now with a metaverse that involves a virtual reality component, because we can have the metaverse um, as sort of like a video game without virtual reality. And we can also access it through virtual reality, which gives us more of that sense of immersion and presence. So that is really the, the newer component of this, this idea um, that more people can now enter a virtual world together and interact together more easily in a more immersed way, which facilitates what we call the sense of presence. And presence just means that it's, it's the sense of being together in a place or being in a place. So if you right now look around the room that you're in, you can have the, you know, the sense of presence that, you know, you're, whatever the space you're in, you feel like I am in this space. If you enter the virtual world, um, virtual reality enables you to feel like you have entered a new space. And we have these ideas, uh, these concepts of physical presence, um, which is you being in that world physically or having the sense that you are, as well as social presence, meaning that you're in that space with others. And then self-presence, the idea that it is actually you who is in that world and you are, um, you know, the avatar that you are navigating the world through is a representation of, of you. So, this uh, sense of immersion and presence builds towards this multi-sensory experience where our different senses are now much more engaged than they would be, for instance, in this Zoom call where you're primarily using your, your um, you know, visual and auditory senses. Here and now you have proprioception, you have a sense of um, a lot more of this um, uh, feeling of, of being fully in the space with your, your full body. So it's in a sense, this extension of the self and that, you know, is, is quite, quite unique in, um, in terms of the types of technologies that we've been using so far. This idea of extending oneself, not just in your mind, because we've been able to do that through stories for uh, forever. Um, not, for instance, when you're reading a book, it's, easier, it's easy to imagine being in, you know, with the characters in the book. But now we can actually be in that place and feel like we are in that place. Like, that is quite, you know, an amazing um, innovation in a sense, this idea of extending ourselves beyond our physical environment and actually feeling like we are there. So um, in a sense, the, the metaverse now allows us to have these real experiences. And I, I say here for better or for worse, because this is where, you know, um, questions now come up. You know, what, what happens? Is this, is this good for us? Um, what are some of the benefits and what are some of the challenges? So this is what I wanted to spend the last bit of the talk um, looking at is, uh, you know, what, what are some of the, the things that we might see um, happen that are good for us? And what are some, some of the things that we're going to have to deal with? And, and certainly for the past two decades, we've seen a lot of issues come up um, that concern us around using different digital technologies and social media. Now, um, the previous speakers have already covered a, a lot of the different types of things that we can do with the metaverse and with virtual reality technology. So some of this may be a little bit repetitive, but um, what I'd like to, uh, to start with when we, when we think about the benefits of the metaverse, because in a sense, even though you know, we've had these metaverse technologies that we've been using, that the true metaverse that's gonna be involving virtual reality, that hasn't really been, um, you know, it's not that accessible yet to everybody. I mean, if you think about, you know, this group of uh, 100 participants, you know, probably not, not everyone here has tried uh, virtual reality even, right? It's not something that is just, you know, it, it, that's accessible to everyone or not everyone has an interest in it. So when we think about the benefits and challenges, a lot of what we're basing this on obviously is from our past experience with different technologies. So whether that's virtual worlds and what we've seen in virtual worlds, um, social media, uh, the gaming environments that, that were discussed as well. A lot has happened in the past two or three decades, well, probably more so two decades in those spaces that really doesn't form our idea about what will happen, what could happen, and how to navigate this to promote, um, to facilitate human well-being. So other lessons we've also learned are from experiments using VR-enabled 
um, experiences. So experiments in labs where we can use VR to, to simulate cer certain situations and see how people will act and react to those. And also we do have some, some new information coming from existing metaverse apps. Uh, some of them were already mentioned like VR chat um, and, and others. Uh, so we are kind of just entering that and, under uh, trying, and understanding or seeing what types of things can happen um, in the metaverse. So again, there's lots of uh, pros and cons like uh, the other technologies that, I, that we already discussed. Um, so one of the, the sort of benefits that have been highly touted for, uh, for the past uh, you know, several decades in research uh, in relation to virtual worlds, such as Second Life, so this is an image from Second Life here, is this um, benefit of being, building community in these worlds. So we have lots of uh, communities that exist online on different social media, but there's something really special about sharing a community with others in a physical space. So you actually can go to a physical space and be there with others and share sort of that same experience of being in that space. And that has really been uh, quite striking about uh, places like Second Life and other gaming environments where people really have the sense of community, of belonging, which is so critical to, to our uh, to well-being, to our experience as humans. And that's something in my research um, that I conducted in Second Life, I noticed. And, and the communities were so so diverse and they were often around, you know, topics that people uh, were interested in. So I, I studied for a, a long time a community of a Star Wars community in Second Life, for instance. There's, so people who have interests around, you know, a, set, a certain um, uh, you know, cultural, cultural um, phenomena, for instance, or there's all kinds of stuff, like, like all kinds of communities that can happen, but some of them are quite established and quite actually um, uh, elaborate, where they had sort of um, a culture about them that was sort of beyond just the culture of the, of, you know, whatever sort of spurred the community. Um, so they had, you know, people who were in more leadership positions, who guided the community, who were influenced and more influential and um, had sort of different roles. And um, so there was a lot of role play as well involved with this, but also the sense of, of you know, togetherness in this common venture, common experience. So I actually found that quite interesting as, uh, you know, as a researcher observing these communities. Um, but also inspiring as well to, to think about, you know, what we can use these spaces for. And that seems to be something that people gravitate to do um, right away. So we also notice that people use virtual spaces similarly to the way that they would use physical spaces. So, you know, the way they gather with their avatars. I mean, uh, when they're chatting, they're not, uh, even though they're, they may be chatting on um, using a keyboard, the avatars in the, are in the same proximity or in a close proximity to each other. So this idea of using proximity to indicate, you know, um, physical presence and, and attention to someone, so attending and being part of a conversation or a group, right? So these are things that can <clears throat> combine sort of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the physical aspects of our um, social interactions with uh, within this digital space. So things that we can do in the real world now are obviously facilitated here. There's also a, a number of studies that show um, some of the benefits of being immersed in a virtual experience and in a sense, walking in someone else's shoes. So this is a, a set of studies and there's a lab at Stanford called the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab. They have a, a whole bunch of studies. They've got a great website if you wanna check out some of what they've done, but they've conducted studies looking at how we can cultivate empathy in, um, in people by immersing them in the experience of someone else. So for instance, this image here shows um, people being led through what it would be like to become homeless. So getting an eviction notice and then eventually losing their home and living in the street. So this idea of cultivating empathy for a fellow human who may be in a different situation than yourself. They've also done studies around racism where they, uh, the participant would be immersed in the body of someone of a different race and they may be subject to, to different um, situations that that a person of that race might be, you know, subject to on a daily basis, and to see what that would feel like, um, you can change. You know, you can embody anyone. You can be a person of a different age, a different uh, gender, different height, and see what the world feels like in that person's shoes. So the, 
some of these studies have shown that people do um, change their their perception of of what it's like to be those individuals, and in fact, may even change their behavior in relationship to um, you know those individuals uh, and their experience. Another aspect um, that goes sort of beyond the social uh, component of empathy is also looking at how we can engage people in more empathy to world, uh, towards our natural world. So um, with different types of experiences that we can have to immerse people in environments that they would never be able to actually, you know, uh, be a part of or to, to ever experience like underwater environments or places that they could never visit. In fact, they've done some studies where they <laughs> immerse people in um, with a VR helmet in water to really give them that full embodied experience of what it's like to be in a marine environment that they would normally not be able to, to enter. Uh, they've also done some simulations of what the world could look like if we don't take care of our planet, if we have natural disasters. So this idea of um, engaging people and thinking about the future of the world and, and the planet. So I think these are some, some really interesting educational experiences for people to promote more social cohesion around solving some of these big problems that we may have. So some of these studies, you know, definitely show that people uh, after en having engaged in those experiences have more of an appreciation for, for the, you know, these different environments in the planet. And certainly we can imagine this as being part of, you know, an educational system that can take advantage of, of these types of experiences for kids that, you know, having these um, sort of almost firsthand experiences, I think, can be so, so interesting and, and precious for um, education. Uh, so there's some discussion already of the use of um, the virtual reality in health and mental health care. Uh, so I'll just uh, highlight a couple other um, use cases for it. So I recently met someone who designed a virtual reality application for people who um, struggle with speaking. And this was a gentleman who actually stutters and he has these training apps for people to practice speaking in front of others, especially if you have a, a speech disorder. It can be quite difficult to overcome social anxiety around speaking. I mean, it's difficult for many of us to speak in a social situation. There are apps actually designed to help people speak uh, in public speaking, to practice public speaking before the real event. And, and certainly uh, the extension there, there is also for those who have speaking um, issues. And um, not only in that case do we use virtual reality to portray the virtual world, but we can also use eye tracking to sort of help um, the participant to integrate both sort of where they're looking and, and um, with that sort of full experience. So it's not just about what they're seeing, but we can also measure kind of what what their body's doing at the same time as they're engaging in that environment. So I don't think we've, we've mentioned that, but there's also this biofeedback possibility that we can potentially even control the environment um, in response to our biological reactions. So whether it's increased heart rate, um, where our eyes look, um, increased um, sweating, things like that, there are measures that we can um, easily obtain now if you think about your Fitbit, for instance, or, or you know, Apple Watch, things that can be integrated with our virtual reality experience that can then change what the world looks like. So we can practice situations and we've talked about the idea of combat um, practice as well. So certainly there's just some, some really interesting um, innovations here that are quite, quite fascinating. Uh, this, uh, we haven't really talked about kids yet, but um, there's lots of examples already, studies showing the effectiveness of using virtual reality for kids in medical, um, context, so whether it's for um, getting simple vaccinations or for kids who um, have issues of pain or painful procedures, VR has been shown to be an effective way to distract uh, individuals when they are undergoing those procedures. So um, this is just, you know, another example uh, of, of a benefit of this type of technology. Now, uh, let's talk about some of the sort of challenges and negative aspects of the virtual um, experience. And uh, one of the, the issues that comes up for um, when you know people are asked about this is people are ex um, quite concerned about this idea of being exposed to sensitive content, especially for young people, right? For teens, for children. And here's some data from a study, a survey of a thousand people. This was conducted by a company called Tide Tidio. And um, so this is uh, asking people what they 
think should be censored content or restricted content in the metaverse. So certainly, you know, we have a list of the types of things that, you know, maybe we don't want our kids to see, whether it's sexually explicit content, racism, uh, religious offenses, uh, using alcohol and drugs, animal abuse. People are really not, not you know, that's not one that um, obviously is, is quite, people feel strongly about violence, hate speech, etc. So these are all issues that we already face in the virtual world, but you can imagine with this virtual reality experience where there's more of this immersiveness, immersion, more presence in the environment, to be exposed to some of this type of sensitive content can potentially be more harmful because it can feel so much more real. And so this is where, you know, there's this concern around like, how do we, you know, how do we actually deal with these issues and how can we effectively regulate these technologies to, um, you know, restrict or, or at least uh, make them safe for, for kids, for teens, and for, for people who also don't want to be harassed and, and exposed to this type of sensitive content. They're there for other reasons. So here are some examples of, uh, this was in the news earlier this year. Um, this is the app VR chat where um, there were some reports of the Metaverse app actually allowing kids into a virtual strip club. So this idea around, you know, how do you, you verify a child's age? It's the same thing that, you know, we have issues around um, already around, uh, on the internet. How do we verify um, a user's age? And certainly, you know, a kid seeing pornography online, it's not ideal seeing it in a more immersive, real and looking environment with avatars that are engaging in um, sexually explicit behavior kid can go in that sort of environment makes people, you know, really uncomfortable, right? So these are some issues that are already coming up and, and certainly um, I'm sure developers are, are, you know, dealing with some of these issues, but uh, I'm sure that we're going to see this for, for a while, you know, these kinds of um, cases come up. Another example is also exposure to harassment. So this was from um, uh, an article um, from the app that Meta has developed, Horizon Worlds where there's someone, you know, who was interacting the app was groped and felt very violated by that experience. So this idea that, you know, even though it's an avatar that it's happening to, when you're in this virtual immersive world, it feels very real to, to be touched inappropriately, for instance. Um, so, you know, this is, again, something that uh, Hopefully, you know, I mean, we're, we're going to have to have some rules around and people may may fear that this is not something that they, they are comfortable doing. So these are some of the things that are coming up, some of the challenges that we have to um, uh, address as we interact in these worlds. And of course, there is this uh, concern, and, and I saw this already in the comments, that people are concerned about this idea of excessive use, right? That we're gonna get hooked on the metaverse like we're hooked on our phones, like we're hooked on, like kids are hooked on video games. And, you know, where is the world going? So this is something that, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, a lot of discourse around, you know, what does it mean to be using the technology, digital technologies all the time? Are we actually all addicted? Is digital addiction even a, a real? Um, you know, there's still a lot of debate around that. And, you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, you know, this is something that, you know, technology um, is, in a sense, it's like food, that we can't just get rid of it. We um, we have to find a way to have a healthy diet in our lives when, you know, we have an excess of, of, of food that's not necessarily nutritious, but, you know, we, we balance how we, uh, what we eat. And it's similar with technology that there's almost like a, a learning process around how to engage with technologies in a way that it's um, healthy and balanced for, for, for any individual. And that might vary between people. So I have this diagram here of what, you know, how we, we think about um, usage in, uh, of, you know, say video gaming or, or social media. Some people are, um, don't use it a lot. Some people, um, will use it, uh, quite a lot, but for the average person, you know, the usage can, can span. So this is sort of our, our normal distribution, right? There will always have people who use it more and people who use it less. And the idea is, you know, understanding what does that mean and how does that relate to, um, their ability to function in the world. And, and have a fulfilling life. For many people if you, um, that are uh, high users or, or use um, virtual worlds a lot, for instance, gamers, 
many of them, you know, are very satisfied with the type of life that they can live and they can actually make money in those worlds um, and in those interactions. So, you know, the idea of just saying, well, you're online a lot, so you must be addicted. That's, you know, that's not, not something that um, is an accurate reflection of what's actually happening. So last thing I wanted to mention too, is this issue around individual responsibility versus the platform design. So that's something that we're talking a lot about um, right now in technology development. How do we create these technologies to promote a healthier balance between use and then you know, real life and engaging in other activities, spending time with family, with children, with your spouse, with parents. Um, so this idea that, you know, is this an individual respons responsibility of the user or do technology companies have the responsibility to create platforms that promote a balance and how healthy um, usage. So I, I certainly, you know, uh, for me, I think there's a really important role for technology companies to play here. And it's not just up to the individual, because in a sense, you can really hack um, the individual's ability to, to um, you know, pull away from the technology. There's a, it's really easy to get hooked on our, on our phones and our devices. So I think there's quite a balance here to, to strike between individuals and companies. And also, you know, thinking about what are some of the risk factors for people to uh, who do maybe use it excessively, who do have issues around um, not being able to function in everyday life. So these are things that we certainly need to study a little bit more. So as we move forward, you know, um, I think it's important to apply the lessons that we've learned so far uh, to inform uh, safety, privacy issues um, in how we use the metaverse. Uh, it's important to lobby for what we call humane or safe technology design that serves us and serves us, um, you know, to have a balanced and healthy life. Um, of course, monitoring patterns of use and, and seeing how that um, translates, you know, what's happening as the technology is rolled out. And for me, you know, I'm always trying to think about this optimistically, you know, we want to move forward. This is a very exciting technology. And I think we can be quite optimistic about it. And of course, cautious and applying the, uh, the lessons that we've learned so far. And again, I just put this wheel up here to just remind us that, you know, well-being in the virtual world is not just, it sort of covers the spectrum of all aspects of our lives. So I would like to thank you so much for your attention. It's, uh, I know it's quite late for, for some of us here. Here is my contact information and if you'd like to um, connect and I really appreciated your time and being here with you. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive and pros and cons, very balanced uh, presentation. That, that's, I think you made a lot of parents feel much better now. <laughs> and because uh, everyone's concerned about their kids' screen time and, and other things. So, all right. So, we're going to start with our QA session. If you have a question, please type it into the QA. At the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A. You can type your question there. Uh, now, I'm going to start with a couple of myself because we are talking about uh, the psychology. I'm just wondering uh, if you have any uh, came, come across any study about the personality change, the introvert, the extrovert. Do they reverse their character in the in the metaverse, or they maintain their own the same type of geeks and nerds, or the extroverts? You know. And that will be to uh, Dr. Lamana Hamskar, obviously. Uh, sorry, so the, the question was, uh, sorry, I was just reading one of the comments, um, yeah. whether people sort of maintain their personality. In or the um, reverse. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it, there's a lot of um, diversity in what people do. And for some people, the internet allows them to express aspects of themselves that they don't feel comfortable expressing in the real world. And others are, are happy, you know, they're, they're happy to be themselves. Um, for the most part, there's uh, this, this theory uh, called the richer get richer. So those who are really good at social interactions, uh, all, you know, in the real world, they're also going to do quite well in the virtual world. But I think we're seeing now that um, even though those who are more introverted, there are ways to engage that are quite effective and, and finding communities of people who 
are like-minded or who resemble them in one way or another. I think that's that's where really you're seeing you know the benefits for some people. So so I think there's quite a lot of diversity, and it's hard to really say you know one way or another. There's no guarantee in a sense, but um, I think people can find themselves find opportunities for themselves quite easily. Thank you. That's fascinating. Uh, my next question is for Serena. Um, you know, we're using credit card, debit card right now. What what's going to happen to these cards in the future, in the metaverse age? Can you give us some idea? Yeah. Um, for example, it's already happening, right? Like this um, new products uh, of credit card com comes out, um, and it's based on uh, cryptocurrency. Um, so when you make payment, you actually pay uh, by the cryptocurrency instead of um, um, uh, with uh, with money. Um, there's the the credit card concept. There's also like a prepaid card uh, concept. So you have to um, deposit money to the card first, um, exchange it into cryptocurrency, and then you can use the uh, credit card to make purchases. Um, it's, I find it, you know, it's actually very attractive to um, the younger generation because they come up with like different tiers um, um, of the card and it gives away, um, uh, uh, like for example, uh, you can get, uh, they will reimburse you on your Spotify account, on, on your um, like YouTube account and also get you like airport um, launch access, uh, things like that. So I feel that it's, uh, it's, it's actually very good for the, um, for the young generation. Thank you. Um, here's a question for Dr. Tsing. Is there a way to use this technology to make education more equitable and cost less? And what is the key of what makes the metaverse success? Uh, is it public blockchains technology or a business model? Well, wow, there's too many questions. Let's focus on the one, how we can use the technology to make education more equitable yeah. and cost less for, for, for poor, for rich and for everybody. Yeah, actually, I, I tried to answer the question by, by, by typing. Uh, uh, the education in metaverse is actually a new concept. And uh, I think some actually um, some companies are trying to do so as well. Uh, you know, the uh, ju just as I mentioned, in the metaverse, so human probably will have a kind of a more, uh, could be more creative. So they can generate different kinds of educational materials or education products. For example, uh, we will learn the mathematics and uh, you can see the uh, optimal point of some special functions. You can see the, this function like a mountain. So it give you a more realistic impression about what, what kind of a mathematical function it is. When you study the medical sciences and you can consider yourself like a cell and you are consider yourself like a virus, maybe you can uh, flow with the uh, of the blood in the vessels, you can see the, the tumor. So that, that will give you a more realistic uh, uh, images of the, uh, uh, like the, the, the tumors, like the cells, like some, you know, internal organs of your body or something that, that will make you more, uh, more impressive. So that could, that will make education more, um, more effective, I think. And um, also um, they mentioned maybe, you know, uh, such education product can be on the uh, public blockchain. So just like the Wikipedia, we can share all this knowledges and the, all the materials to the, uh, to the public. But uh, at the same time, it's also possible there could be some commercial companies that are using the, uh, uh, using the expert to design some uh, like a, like, like a, like art or whatever, or design some very uh, different kind of education product that can make the education more effective. And uh, the people uh, find out that will more helpful to the children or to themselves, they'd like to pay, it will be fine. And also <clears throat> if you if the, the product can be uh, used by a lot of people, so the average cost uh, will be uh, lower. And so that is the, um, the, uh, the, the way uh, we, we can reduce this, the cost. Yeah, so I think this is still a new concept and it's still an open question. So how we can do more effective education in the metaverse. 
uh, that leaves a lot of space to explore. Uh, thanks for that. Thank you. The next question I want to go to uh, James. Uh, you expert on second life. So what is second life? Explain to us. I, I didn't hear the question. What is second life? Uh, well, Second Life is a virtual world platform that launched in 2003, and yeah, very early on, uh, it was originally a, a a virtual world simulation. So you would go in, and there would be animals and creatures, and as they launched it, it became evident that it was actually the metaverse or a, a, an early conception of it. So. Uh, yeah, it launched in 2003, and yeah, very, very early on, became kind of the first prototype of a metaverse platform that fit the the Neil Stevenson definition. With uh, you know, it, so so you know, massive virtual world, lots of user generated content, lots of tools to create content, integration with the real world economy, so you could actually make a living, you could make money by creating content in the virtual space. And there's ways of connecting it to the outside world, like you could connect it to robots and cars and so on. Right. Uh, there's a question about psychology again. I think it's good to answer to everyone. Uh, when we have more and more humanoid robots uh, to become companions and, or even partners, how would that mm -hmm. impact on our psychology? That, well, I'll give that to Anna. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I started answering in the chat. Um, you know, this is sort of one of those, it's a difficult question to answer because obviously there's something that draws people to this experience of having intimacy in a very safe context. But, you know, the one thing about human intimacy and having true connections is this idea of vulnerability, of trust and opening yourself up to another human being and opening yourself up to potentially being hurt, right? That's sort of part of what a, a real relationship is, a true sort of intimate relationship. So if you're engaging um, in a relationship with an avatar, or, sorry, or what we call an agent in the virtual world or an AI um, uh, based robot or any sort of technology like that, you know, is it designed to always please you? Is it designed to act like a real partner where, you know, it, it really depends on what, what its goal is. Um, it's, you know, I, I, I have a hard time seeing that happening in the near future, but who knows, right? Lots of science fiction, science fiction books written about it, but I would say, you know, with the technology that currently exists, um, you know, I have a hard time seeing whether that could be a good replacement. Now, some people might be actually happy with this though. So, you know, I don't judge, <laughs> but, um, are they able to, to lead a satisfactory and happy life in that context? You know, that is really the question. I guess you can have a perfect one in the metaverse and, you know, never answer back, see you to everything you want. Right. <laughs> as, as rich, as tall, as beautiful as you want. But that's, right. that's probably an easier realization you know, application for that. Uh, well, here's a question must be from a mathematician. So, uh, would the matter help uh, create new concepts such as the imaginary number i in complex numbers? Uh, who will take that one? I, I guess the um, the square root of minus y. I think that's what it is. Uh, that, that's a very technical. Anyone want to take that one? Doctor Ching. Uh, sorry, I, I haven't got the question. So, <laughs> what, so what, what you mean? What uh, is that? Well, the question was: Will, will the uh, metaverse be very helpful uh, in creating new concepts, such oh. as the imaginary number i in complex numbers? Well, actually, uh, we don't need a metaverse to create the uh, <laughs> idea for the complex number. It has been existing for for, for decades. Uh, if not more than 100 years. So what I'm trying to say is um, I consider considering about the mathematics and the mathematics you can consider as a representation of the uh, concepts and objects in our real world. And uh, in mathematics, we cares 
about two things, basically. One, it, about the representation. For example, uh, we use numbers, we use vectors, we use imaginary number or different kinds of rational numbers to represent uh, the continuum in the uh, time and the space. And the second basic idea is about the relation. So, you know, the relation between the variable X and the variable Y, and uh, what happens if you change one variable, and if you change your input, what will happen to the output? Um, so for, 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 for the, the, uh, the question about the imaginary number, I don't think we don't need a metaverse. So. And but for the uh, mathematics education in the future, so maybe they can give you more uh, sense. Uh, what, what I'm trying to say is in the metaverse, we can only, you know, we can only feel the uh, three-dimensional space, but in the metaverse, we can involve more information than that. And uh, when you learn some mathematics and uh, for example, you wanna understand what is the pi is, you can go smaller and smaller, smaller in the metaverse. Maybe we can design some program like that. So you can go deeper and deeper understanding, you know, what, what is the minimum, something like that. It will, def it, it will definitely help, but still I cannot see in, you know, <laughs> what, what, what exactly will happen, but that will be a very open qu qu question now. So I, I don't know how to answer that, yeah. All right, so thank you. Uh, before I ask the final question, just want to answer one question about the, the recording. Uh, we will put this on YouTube to let everyone know if you want to rewatch it or want to pass on to your friends. Uh, you know, uh, this link will be sent out probably by Monday. Uh, so our final question goes to Serena again, our finance person. So what will uh, financial transfer and e-transfer and financial uh, online banking be different in the metaverse year compared to now? Um, in my mind, right, um, right now, um, for a lot of the banks and financial institutions, because they have been around for a long time, there's a, a number of legacy systems and uh, a lot of time, the legacy systems they are um, they are they are like uh, operating, you know, like in 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 batch processing and and all that. So it's a lot of time is not uh, real time. Um, and sometimes I don't know if you have the experience, but you know, let's say you transfer money and um, and you thought that it didn't go through, and then you did it again. It ended up it happened two times or. You try to do a transfer, and then um, um, you know after a day, you know you haven't the money has has disappeared from your account, but it has not show up yet in the other account. So that type of uh, situation can totally be corrected um, with the the make use of technology like you know blockchain. Um, you know the transaction is immediate and you know close to real time and. You save a lot of um, resources in reconciling um, transactions from one um, entity to another. So definitely, we can speed up. So speed is so it's a major uh, characteristic on there. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you again, sincerely, to our speakers from uh, around the world, and thank you for taking the time. I know you're all very busy people. Uh, I really appreciate you helping us and present this public education program to the people who are interested in. So thank you again. And I want to thank the audience for coming in and to join us. And again, so uh, look for the link. We'll send it up to you uh, to forward to anyone who is interested. So thank you very much, everyone, speakers in the audience. And good night from Toronto. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good day. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye. Bye.